Well, good morning and happy Sunday to you, online friends and family. Thank you for joining us once again. And as always, I want to thank you for your continued support. You're our partners and you have a big part to play in what we're able to do in terms of uh, advancing the gospel throughout the entire earth, which is our, our commission as a church in these last days. So once again, I want to thank you. And uh, we, we definitely value you. Amen. So, um, as we begin every Sunday service, we'll do the same this Sunday, and we'll start by exhorting you in the areas of tithes and offerings. And before I start that, let me just put you in remembrance of the different categories that we have available to you. Number one, obviously the tithe. Number two, the general offering. And then number three, we believe in biblical partnership as explained and as we're exhorted to participate in as believers, Galatians chapter 6, verses 6 through 8, Philippians chapter 1, Philippians chapter 4, um, and then there's uh, more scriptures in Corinthians um, that tell you that. And then even in the Old, Old Testament, you see the principle of sowing into the life of the prophet. Uh, even Jesus talked about prophet's reward. So we believe in that. Um, and then Dr. Wilkes issues a favorite challenge every week. Uh, that favorite challenge is designed for you to sow into his life and then just like the Apostle Paul stated and declared of his partners, they, they share in the same grace. They share in that same favor. So we can access the favor that's on the life of our teachers. And that's, an, uh, that's a, a principle that God ordained that's outlined in scripture. So those are the different offerings that we have available for you. And in addition to that, just want to keep you in remembrance of July 17th, which is next Sunday, where, where we'll be celebrating our pastor and the founder of this ministry's birthday. So I want to open that up for you as well. Our preference would be that all of you come and attend in person, but if you can't make it, uh, I hate even saying that because I, I believe if you really want to be here, you'll be here. So I exhort you to come, encourage you to come. Uh, Hebrews 10 and 25 uh, also does that. So I'm doing that based on Hebrews 10 and 25. It's not about pressure. It's just about us obe obeying God and assembling ourselves, doing it even more faithfully as we see the day approaching. So we'll be celebrating Dr. Brooks' birthday uh, next Sunday, July 17th. Amen. So I want to open that up to you. We're going to prepare an extra seed to song to his life and appreciation for how God is using him and has used him in the past and in the present and in the future to bless us all. Amen. So having said that, um, let's look at a different scripture today. We've been looking at 1 Timothy chapter 6, but I want uh, to go over to the Old Testament and look at 1 Kings chapter 3. So grab your Bibles and turn with me to 1 Kings chapter 3. And uh, we're still looking at tithes and offerings in light of the three points that we've been teaching on. Point number one, in the Holy Spirit. That's a reference to the location of the life of Christ, also the kingdom of God. And then number two, you have to lay up a good foundation. If you're going to lay hold on eternal life, the eternal life that you and I are called to, we have to lay up a good foundation consisting of the riches that endure forever. And we do that um, via the avenue of giving. So right now, if we're doing tithes and offerings, that's what should be on our minds. Uh, laying up a good foundation. Now that foundation consists of the riches that do endure forever. Those riches can't be uh, material or financial riches because material and financial riches don't, don't endure forever. So that's something that's spiritual. That's something that's contained in Christ. Well, Christ lives in us via the person of the Holy Spirit. So those true riches are in us. Amen. So God wants our, the roots of our being to be deeply rooted and grounded in him and in the contents 
um, of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And then lastly, you have to reap it out. You have to reap it out. When a, a, a farmer plants a harvest, there comes a time where that seed begins to germinate and whatever's contained in that seed penetrates the surface of the ground. At that point, those uh, who work in the field uh, can, can perceive, they can actually see, excuse me, and recognize the fruit. And there, there comes a time when that fruit or the vegetables, that crop is ripe, and then they pull it out. They reap it. They lay hold of it and pull it out. So that, the words lay hold, reap, imagery, it gives us a, a natural point of reference. So just like the farmers, those who work the field, um, when they can see the harvest, they lay hold of it and pull it out or they reap it. Well, the things that are in our, in our born again spirit, the things that are contained in the Holy Spirit that he literally shares with us, he wants, <clears throat> we need to lay hold of those things, pull them out of the realm of the spirit so that we can use them in this natural realm that we live in. Amen. The fruits of the spirit are, are just that, spiritual fruits, but they have to benefit us in the natural. The riches that endure forever are spiritual riches, but they, they, they have to serve us in this natural realm. So we have to reap them out of the spirit realm so uh, we can put them to use in this natural realm. Amen? So having said that, we're looking at verse Kings chapter, 1 Kings chapter 3, and we'll begin at verse 4. Now, I'm sorry to, to continue to, to stop, but then again, I'm not. Just want to keep this before us. And the Holy Spirit wants to keep this before us. When we sow, uh, we reap. And our expectation needs to be uh, in priority with the, the expectations or the desires of God. God wants to give us the kingdom first. God wants to give us uh, the riches that endure forever. God wants our attention to turn from out here in the natural realm into in here in our spirits. Amen. Well, who's in our spirit? The, the spirit of God and everything that can, that's contained in the Holy Spirit, the entire Godhead. The Father, the Son, and the Spirit of God lives on the inside of us. We're literally one with them. And the, and the Spirit of God is sharing the very life and person of Jesus Christ. And that's what we want to lay hold of first and foremost. And this gives you a good illustration of Solomon and how his desires were in line with the desires of God to the point that when God asked Solomon, what do you want? Solomon's answer lined up perfectly with God's will and God was pleased with the answer that Solomon uh, gave him. And we want to do the same thing. We want our desires to be pleasing to the Father. Amen. So this gives us an, a good, good example of what happens when a believer's desires, what that believer is aiming for, lines up with God's will. So we'll begin at verse 4. It says, The king went to Gibeon near Jerusalem, where stood the tabernacle, and the bronze altar to sacrifice there, for that was the great high place. Now, we're the tabernacle now. Now the presence of God lives on the inside of us. One, and then uh, the Solomon sacrificed 1,000 burnt offerings Solomon offered on the altar. Now watch this. In Gibeon, the Lord appeared to Solomon. So, what I think of and what we should be thinking of when we see those three words, the Lord appeared, is Solomon having personal experience with the Lord. So Solomon gave an offering and then God appeared to Solomon. God got personal. He visited Solomon. So what you and I should be expecting when we give is just that. 
we should we should be expecting for God to give us another personal experience with him. Remember one of the, the foundation scriptures that uh, Dr. Wilkes has been teaching from over the last decade is found in 2 Corinthians 13 and 5. And 2 Corinthians 13 and 5 has this, contains this principle that realization is preceded by personal experience, uh, ever-increasing experience. So that's what's happening in the life of Solomon. In Gibeon, the Lord appeared to Solomon in a dream by night, and God said, ask, what shall I give you? Now watch what Solomon says. Solomon said, you have shown to your servant David, my father, great mercy and loving kindness, according as he walked before you in faithfulness, righteousness, and uprightness of heart with you. And you have kept for him this great kindness and steadfast love that you have given him a son to sit on his throne this day. Now, O Lord my God, you have made your servant king instead of, my, instead of David my father, and I am but a lad in wisdom and experience. I, not, I know not how to go out Begin or come in. Finish. Your servant is in the midst of your people whom you have chosen, a great people who cannot be counted for, counted for multitude. Now, Solomon, being king, his destiny, his purpose was to uh, rule over God's people. And it says, so give your servant an understanding mind and a hearing heart to judge your people, that I may discern between good and bad, for who is able to judge and rule this your great people? It pleased the Lord that Solomon had asked this. Well, Solomon, when, when the Lord appeared to Solomon, Solomon answered to the Lord when, when, when God said, what do you want? Solomon's desires were in perfect alignment with his destiny. Amen. And you and I have a destiny. Our destiny is to be transformed into the image of Jesus Christ. So when we give, we know that we're, we're reaping. But that harvest, that the most important and significant harvest as it relates to our destiny is a harvest that comes from the Holy Spirit, the harvest of eternal life, which is our destiny. Us laying hold on eternal life is our destiny. So we need to start sowing with destiny in mind as opposed to money and material things in mind. Now, we'll continue reading. God said to him, because you have asked this, and have not asked for long life or for riches, nor for the lives of your enemies, but have asked for yourself understanding to recognize what is just and right. Behold, I have done what you asked. I have given you a wise and discerning mind so that no one before you uh, was your equal, nor shall anyone arise after you equal to you. I have also given you. Now, wait a minute. God gave him just what he asked for. A wise and understanding heart. God gave him that, but now he's given him something more. He says, I've also given you what you have not asked, both riches and honor, so that there shall not be any among the kings equal to you all your days. And if you will go my way, keep my statutes and my commandments as your father David did, did, then I will lengthen your days. So this second portion, what God added on in addition to Solomon's request, are the things that everybody desires. But this scripture reminds me of Matthew 6 and 33 because Solomon's mind Solomon's focus, Solomon's aim was on the kingdom 
And God, the Bible says, God will freely give us the kingdom. That's his desire. He has no problem giving us the kingdom. It's just that most of us don't desire the kingdom. We're still operating in the flesh, and we desire money and material things over and above everything else. And the reason being is because we're under the deception that life consists of the abundance of things that a man possesses. Life is not out here. Life is in here. In him we live, and in him we move, and in him we have our being. That has to become real to us. But I have good news. That's what the Spirit of God has been sent on the inside of you and I to do. Make spiritual things, namely the Lord Jesus Christ, real to us. Amen. How? By giving us personal experience that will result in us receiving the ability to perceive the reality of Christ in us. Amen. But again, Matthew 6 and 33, that, that a principle is operating right here because God gave him the kingdom. Then he added all the other things to him. If God can get us focused on the kingdom, he has no problem adding the other things in the natural realm that we need, want, and desire. But our heart can't be set on those things. We can't love the things of this world. We're supposed to love God with all of our heart, all of our soul, and all of our strength. Amen. So as you sow today, keep that in mind. Sow with the kingdom in mind. Sow desiring to reap an internal harvest. A harvest of what? The life the person of Jesus Christ, beginning with Jesus himself giving you personal experience with him that's going to enable you to realize the reality of him living on the inside of you. That realization will grow more strong and more clear with each and every experience. So the main thing that you and I should desire and expect is an ever increasing experience with the Lord. Amen. So govern yourselves accordingly. You're aware of the uh, two options that we made available to you, our online friends and family. Number one, the obvious option since we're online is online giving. You can go to vinelifechristianfellowship.com and do your, your tithes and your offerings via our website. Number two, let me draw your attention to the bottom of your screen in the description box. You'll find the address to the ministry, and you can mail in your tithes and offerings, your partnership, and or your favor seed to that, to that address. Amen? So those are the two options we've made available for you. Let me thank you in advance for your continued support, and I declare that you will reap eternal life. I declare that first and foremost, God will give you personal experience with him that will result in your realization of the reality of Christ growing and increasing, becoming more strong and more clear to you. Amen. So let's go ahead and grab our Bibles and make our confession of faith and begin the message for today. Repeat after me. This is my Bible. I am what it says I am. I can do what it says I can do. I have what it says I have. I'm a believer, not a doubter. I'm a doer, not just a hearer. And my life is the better after having heard the word of faith. Faith comes by hearing, and hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Amen. Okay, and um, don't mind being repetitious. We've been Covering three different points. Number one, in the Holy Spirit. That statement should remind you of what's contained in the Holy Spirit. And the bottom line is it's the life of Christ. The scripture that corresponds with that in this series is Romans 14, verse 17, which talks about the kingdom, the kingdom being righteousness, peace, 
and joy where? In the Holy Spirit. In the Holy Spirit. Number two, uh, you have to lay up a good foundation. The corresponding scripture is found in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 17, 17 through 20. And then lastly, you have to reap it out. Galatians 6 and 8. If you sow to the Spirit, you reap from the Spirit eternal life. As, as believers, that's our goal. Jesus came to give us his life. He wanted us to have it in abundance to the full till it overflows. The Apostle Paul said it a different way in Ephesians chapter 3. He says that you and I uh, should be bodies fully flooded and filled with God himself. We should receive the richest measure of the divine presence and become a body holy filled and flooded with God himself. Amen. That is really our true redemption because Adam was a body fully flooded and filled with God himself until he sinned. You and I were born in sin. Uh, that's Therefore, we came into this earth having the need to be what? Born again. When we're born again, the Spirit of God comes to live in our spirit. Therefore, the Spirit of God and our spirit become one. Amen. And that's our redemption. Now, the Spirit of God is already comfortable. He's already settled down and living comfortably in our spirits because the blood of Jesus has cleansed us. One offering has perfected and cleansed us forever. That's talking about our spirit. Amen. If Jesus never came and shed his blood to remit for the remission of our sins, then the Spirit of God could never dwell in us. The reason in the Old Testament the Spirit of God lived in the in what they call the tabernacle or the Ark of the Covenant because the Spirit of God could not dwell inside of sinful man. But you and I have been perfected and cleansed forever by the blood of Jesus. Therefore, the Spirit of God can come live on the inside of our spirit. Amen. So you and I are considered holy, a holy temple of God. Our bodies literally are the temple of the Holy Spirit. So when, we, when we're looking at these three points, we've been looking at uh, point number two. We'll continue along those lines just to get more understanding. So this can be a greater reality in our lives. First Timothy chapter six, I want to begin at verse six, and I won't stop at these, these uh, you know, verses six, uh, seven, and eight, or seven through nine, because we've, we've done a lot of uh, stopping. I want, to, I want to get a little bit further today. So we'll begin at uh, First Timothy chapter six, verse six. It says, and it is indeed a source of immense profit for godliness accompanied with contentment. That contentment, which is a sense of inward sufficiency, is great and abundant gain. So you and I shouldn't be, uh, again, God is in, in a general sense. What is God doing? He is redirecting our focus from out here to in here. Amen. Inward sufficiency. The reason that inward sufficiency continues to elude believers is that anything inward requires the Holy Spirit to shed light. He wants to flood our lights, our heart, the eyes of our heart, with light so that we can see him and what he is sharing with us. Amen. Otherwise, we can't lay hold of it. Amen. So the problem is, is that we bring a, a worldly and carnal mindset into our relationship with God. And until the Lord chastens us, we'll continue, we'll continue in that way. We'll continue in the deception that life is out here. But God has a plan to chasten all of us and redirect our focus on the inside of us. Because on the inside of us is the Godhead. On the inside of us 
is the riches that endure forever. On the inside of us is all the answers that we've been looking for. On the inside of us is inward sufficiency. If you have God living on the inside of you, think about what you don't have. God is all sufficient. So in, in, in reality, believers lack nothing. It's just that we have to learn how to lay hold on what God has already given us. Amen. That begins with him giving us personal experience so that we can realize, realize or perceive the reality of his life on the inside of our born again spirit. Amen. Verse 7 says, for we brought nothing into the world and obviously we can take, we can, we can't take anything out of the world. But if we have food and clothing, with these we should be content. If we have inward sufficiency, then we're, we're, we'll never feel, even if we only have one change of clothing, clothing, a person who has inward sufficiency, a person who can perceive God on the inside of them, will still feel a, a great sense of thankfulness and gratefulness. Because you, you have everything that you, you could ever desire in God. But if you can't perceive him, you can't value what you can't perceive. And so the Holy Spirit, that's, one, that's on the top of the list of the Holy Spirit's priority, is to give us the ability to perceive him. Amen. For we brought nothing into the world, and obviously we, cannot, we can't take anything out of it. But if we have food and clothing, with these we shall be content and satisfied. Now, having food and clothing doesn't mean that that's all that God wants you to have. But the attitude God wants us to have is, hey, if I have food, praise the Lord. If I have clothing, thank you, Lord. Amen. But those who crave to be rich fall into temptation and a snare and into many foolish, useless, godless, and hurtful desires that plunge men into ruin and destruction and miserable perishing. Those who crave to be rich. Rich there is talking about uh, material, financial riches. Material, financial riches will never satisfy you. Why is that? Because you and I are spiritual beings. We have a soul. There's three separate and distinct parts of us. There's the spirit, there's the soul, and there's the body. The essence of who we are is our spirit. A spiritual being cannot be satisfied by anything in the natural. Our spirit man was designed by God to be a home for his spirit and a home for the things contained uh, within his spirit. Anything outside of the Holy Spirit and what's contained in him cannot bring us satisfaction. Let me say that again. Anything outside of the Holy Spirit and what's contained in him, given that we are spirits, that's the essence of who we are, cannot satisfy us. That's why God, his ultimate goal in chastening, chastening us is to get us to be sharers, get us to be humble enough to receive what he is giving. And the Spirit of God, according to Romans 8 and 15, is producing sonship. That's his priority. That's what he wants to share with us. Again, Romans 8 and 29 outlines our destiny as believers. It's to be transformed into the image of our Lord Jesus Christ and share inwardly his likeness. Well, who's sharing the likeness of Christ with us? The Spirit of God in us. He's sharing the likeness of Christ with us. But if we're not looking and we're not humble enough to receive what the Spirit of God is sharing, the Lord has to do a work to get our attention from out here to what's on the inside of our born-again spirit, which is the life of Christ. Amen. Verse 2, um, 
For the love of money is a root of all evils. It is through this craving that some have been led astray and have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves through with many acute mental pains. The love of money. Us desiring money above God. Us deifying money, stuff, and things. What do I mean when I say deifying money, stuff, and things? When we look to money, stuff, and things for satisfaction, for contentment, we're deifying them because satisfaction and contentment has one single source, and that source is God. So when we're looking for that stuff in money, stuff, and things, when we're looking for satisfaction, and contentment and money, stuff, and things, we're making money, stuff, and things our God. Proof, the proof of that is that even when we uh, get born again, filled with the Holy Spirit, and start attending church and start giving, we give with the sole desire of reaping money, stuff, and things. Amen, all of us. But then God in his mercy does a work. See, God knows that we are carnal. God knows that we have fleshly tendencies. God knows that we have carnal desires, and without him, we lack what it takes to overcome those carnal desires. But God supplies us with grace to meet, grace to meet every single evil tendency. Every, every single evil tendency how fully so if god knows that we need grace he definitely is going to see to it that we get it but what what enables us to receive grace it's humility it's humility and so god does a work of humility in the lives of every willing believer in the lives of every willing believer not, every, not everybody is willing to, to be humble. Amen. But God is working in you and I, giving us the will and giving us the ability to do what pleases him. Amen. The thing of it is, the thing that I love about God is that we can be open and honest with him and even if we see something in the word, or if the Holy Spirit is convicting us in the area of our life that we don't want to change, if we're, if we're truthful with him and say, Lord, you know what? I know you're dealing with me on this. I know, I know that my desire for money, stuff, and thing, things is inordinate. It's, it's, it's evil. And, but I, I like it. If you, you can tell him that, and what will he do? He'll give you his will. He'll give you the will and the desire and the ability to change. God knows us. God, Jesus, is our ally. Jesus is our mediator. Amen. So we have, we have a merciful and sympathetic high priest on our side living on the inside of us, who is willing to do whatever it takes to get us to a place where we can receive sufficient grace to meet every evil tendency fully. Amen. Now, verse 11 says, But as for you, O man of God, flee all these things. We just went over all those things. Amen. And pursue Righteousness, right standing with God, godliness, which is the loving fear of God, and being Christ-like. Faith, love, steadfastness, patience, and gentleness of heart. Now, let me read that one more time. It says, but as for you, O man of God, flee all these things, aim at and pursue righteousness, right standing with God, and true godliness, Pursue godliness, which is the loving fear of God, and being Christ-like. Pursue faith, pursue love, pursue steadfastness, pursue, pursue patience, 
and gentleness of heart. Well, if God is telling me to pursue these things, where can I find them? Glad you asked that question. You can find them right there on the inside of you. All he and his personal attributes are on the inside of you. That's why the Spirit of God wants to flood the eyes of our spirit with light so that we can see him and we can see all that he's sharing with us. When it talks about us seeing or uh, perceiving, getting insight, comprehensive insight into the plans and purposes of God, well, we already know what his plan and his purpose is. Romans 8, 29, to transform us into the image of Jesus Christ. Well, Jesus lives on the inside of us, and that transformation is a direct result of personal experience. Getting to know God personally, having intimate knowledge of God, intimate acquaintance with God is transformative. You can't get to know God and stay the same. Amen. When we experience God personally, we experience his love for us. And as we experience, keyword experience, the love of God personally, the roots of our being, the roots of our being are deeply planted in love. That becomes, that becomes the foundation of our mind, our will, our emotions. Amen. See, reaping eternal life means pulling it out of our spirit into the realm of realization where we can perceive it and we can now lay hold on it and benefit from it and use it in this natural realm. Spiritual things, as long as they remain in the spirit realm, have really no benefit to us in this natural realm. That's why God has given us faith. Faith is the substance of things hoped for. It's the evidence of things not seen. So faith gives you the ability to perceive spiritual reality. Without faith, you, you, cannot, you cannot perceive spiritual realities. But the reason God wants us to see the reality of spiritual things so we can use them in this natural realm so that these spiritual things in our spirit will affect our personality. And when, when our personality is rooted in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ, then those roots uh, ultimately will produce the fruit of the Lord Jesus Christ. Our personalities will, will be in harmony with him. Now he can flow through us. He can, he can literally live through us. It'll be us living in harmony. Amen. But that, that can't happen without personal experience. You, you, you can't be like somebody or you can't. And it, let, me, let me rephrase that because that's not really accurate. You can't be transformed into somebody. Somebody's life can't be reproduced in you unless there's intimacy, personal intimacy, intercourse. Intercourse causes reproduction. Intercourse causes reproduction. Intercourse precedes reproduction. And that's our destiny. Now it goes on to say, fight the good fight of faith and do what? Lay hold of eternal life to which you were summoned or to which you were called, and for which you confessed a, the good confession of faith before many witnesses. So there's our goal. There's our goal to lay hold of eternal life. There's our destiny to lay hold of eternal life. Just like if we were in the apple orchard, they planted uh, apple seeds. Out of those seeds are trees. And after, after a time, those trees start to bear fruit. And we're in the apple orchard, and what do we do? We lay hold on those apples. Well, inside of our spirit is the Holy Spirit who's sharing the life of Christ. The Holy Spirit makes, makes Jesus real to us. How? Through personal experience. And that 
personal experience causes us, the roots of our being, to be firmly planted in the Lord. Just like the roots of a plant are deeply planted into the soil, that enables those, those roots to start to bear fruit. When that fruit appears, you can lay hold on it. So <clears throat> once we realize Jesus and his person, we can start reaping it. We can start realizing it, and his character will become our character. His life will be our life. And when people experience us, they'll experience him simultaneously because there's no difference. Amen. That's a reality in our spirit, but it's a progressive reality in our soul. It's a progressive reality in our personality. And, and that's what's taking place. You and I are making progress with every personal experience. The, the, uh, the experience of God is ever increasing causing us, causing our personal knowledge and understanding of him to be more strong and to be more clear, to be more accurate. And remember that personal knowledge, that intimacy with the Lord is transformative. Amen. We become like him as we experience him. Glory to God. So now, fight the good fight of faith, lay hold on eternal life. Key, key phrase right there, lay hold of the eternal life. Let's read that together. I know you're at home, but in the spirit, we're together. So on the count of three, one, two, three, lay hold of the eternal life. Let's do it two more times. One, two, three, lay hold of the eternal life. One, two, three, lay hold of the eternal life. That's our goal. That's our destiny. We need to see our relationship with God uh, through that lens, through the lens of eternal life. That's our goal. So now, when we get down to verse 17, it starts to instruct us as to what we need to do to lay hold of eternal life. Verse 12 directs us to the goal, but in verse 17, it starts to tell us how to get there or how to achieve it or how to realize that goal. Verse 17 through 20. As for, as for the rich in this world, talking about us, because we have more than enough, charge them not to be proud and arrogant and contentious of others, nor to set their hope on uncertain riches. That's the hard part. Nor to set their hopes on uncertain riches. That's something we can't do without the help of the Holy Spirit. But the Holy Spirit lives on the inside of us, and the Holy Spirit is willingly sharing His will willingly sharing and imparting his desires to us. He's also imparting grace. Amen. The grace that is sufficient to meet this evil tendency and all others fully. So we have hope. Amen. Charge them not to be proud and arrogant and contemptuous of others, nor to set their hope on uncertain riches, but on God. When you experience God personally, you'll begin to see who he really is. You'll begin to see what he really wants to do. You'll begin, and as you experience him, primarily his love, because you can't experience God without experiencing the love of God, the love that he cherishes for you, because that is who God is. God doesn't just love, God is love. That's all he can do. Everything God does is love. Amen. That's who he is. So when you experience God personally, that's why you need to experience him personally. Because he loves you personally. When God talks about his love, he's talking about his love for each and every individual. Not just in a general sense. When the Bible says God so loves the world, he's talking about each individual soul in the world. And so each individual soul in the world needs to experience God's love personally in order for his love to be real to you. The Holy Spirit wants to glorify the Lord. He wants to make him and his love for you real to you. He wants to solidify the love of God in your soul 
to the point where you're literally rooted and grounded in it. He wants the love of God to be so real to you uh, so that when hell comes knocking at your door, and if it hasn't, it's coming, you can still, the love of God will be so etched in your memory that you can recall each experience and stay uh, clean. You can still cleave to God and cling to him. And, and, and nobody can literally take you out of his hand because you're rooted and grounded. You have the roots of your being deeply rooted and grounded in him. How? By way of personal experience. Jesus said, he said of us that he's planted us. You know, when he was talking to the disciples, he was talking to us in the future. And the disciples were experiencing Jesus personally. But, just like Jesus told them, it's, it's expedient, it's advantageous for you that I leave. Because you've known me in the flesh, but the Spirit of God is going to come and help you know me personally. Know me from the Spirit and by the Spirit. You can see that testimony by the Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 5. He said that we used to know Christ in the flesh and as a man. Because just like the disciples, Paul has seen Christ in a vision. Paul can literally tell you what Jesus looks like. But that, that, that level of knowledge doesn't compare to the knowledge that Paul gained of the Lord Jesus via the Holy Spirit. Amen. Glory to God. So as for the rich in this world, charge them not to be proud or arrogant, contemptuous of others, nor set their hopes on uncertain riches, but set our hopes on God, who does what? Who richly and ceaselessly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. Now, all of us need to experience God providing, providing for us. Otherwise, that's not going to be real. That's why the Holy Spirit will challenge you. He'll challenge, he'll give you money tests so that you can have personal experience with that aspect of God's character. The, the aspect or the, the facet of God being your provider. Amen. We're running out of time. Charge them to do good, to do good, uh, and to be rich in good works, to be liberal and generous of heart, ready to share with others. You can sum that, verse 18, up in giving. Now, in this way, what way? Giving. In this way, what way? Giving. In this way, what way? Giving. Laying up for themselves the riches that endure forever as a good foundation. A foundation is laid in you and I through personal experience. So when you give, we need to stop just expecting uh, God to bless us with money, stuff, and things. We need, God, we need to expect God to bless us with his, with his presence. We need to expect God to bless us with another personal experience that will cause us to experience and to walk in a higher level a clearer and deeper level of knowledge uh, of him, personal knowledge, experiential knowledge, which will bring us to another level of transformation. That is the harvest that you and I need to desire over and above anything. And again, the Holy Spirit is the one who gives us those desires. So don't sweat that. The Spirit of God is working on the inside of you, both to will and to do of his good pleasure. That's nothing that you and I can do through human effort. It's something that only the Holy Spirit will do, and he is doing it when you give. When you give, the, the, the attributes of the Lord Jesus Christ will be rooted. Your, your, the, the roots of your being will be rooted and grounded in him because giving is an exchange for personal experience. We're giving our money in exchange for him. He is our gold. He is our precious silver treasure. Amen. Well, we're out of time. I want to thank you for joining us once again. We appreciate uh, your partnership. We appreciate your participation. We appreciate you. So, I'm going to continue to uh, exhort you 
to come and join us in person. It's, it's wonderful that we have uh, the internet and these tools, but these tools are supplementary. They're, they're, not, they're not the main course. So we're supposed to be experiencing each other in person. These are days where we need to encourage each other personally. We need to look out for each other personally. And first and foremost, we need to hear the word of God as, as, as taught by the man of God. Amen. So having said that, I declare that no evil shall befall you, no plague shall come, up, come nigh your dwelling. God has given his angels charge over you. They keep you in all your ways. Uh, one more thing. Remember, this coming uh, next Sunday, July 17th, we'll be celebrating our, our pastor and our founder's birthday. So come and join us in person. He'd love to see you. We'd love to see you. So God bless you. Enjoy the rest of your day. Looking forward to seeing you uh, Tuesday morning at 10 o'clock or 7 p.m. And then, of course, Sunday morning, 9.15. God bless you. Enjoy the rest of your day. For more information on Vine Life Christian Fellowship, please visit our website at www.vinelifechristianfellowship.com. Options concerning the tithe, offerings, partnership, or favor challenge are located in the description box below. It is our hope that you have been blessed and enlightened by this message. As we begin our online journey, we encourage you to subscribe to this channel ensuring that you will not miss future messages. On behalf of Vine Life Christian Fellowship, we would like to thank you for joining us. Have a blessed day, and we will see you next time.